guys can hear. Hear me? Good. Kyle. So I feel completely out of my element because I have no idea what that guy was just talking about. <laughs> completely lost me. I'm a photographer, videographer. I um, guess you can see by the logo, we do aerial photography. It's a part of what we do. It's not all that I do. Um, but obviously it's a huge emerging uh, business, so it's good to come and talk to you guys about it. Uh, but we're based here in Raleigh. I've gotten to know Kyle kind of, to, I guess, talk this morning about the legal side of things, and hopefully he's helping to keep me honest on uh, following the rules and all that. So just kind of roll right into it. Why UAVs uh, for us? I started out as a the photography side, not as a UAV enthusiast. So for me, it was more about how can I get images like this? And this is actually one we took the other day for the Raleigh Chamber of Commerce. So kind of give you an idea of what we could do with you know fairly small drones, that sort of thing. Um, kind of two routes into what we do generally. It's uh, people that got into it through being UAV or like hobbyists or people like me that were photographers and videographers and just wanted, looking for a way to get a camera up in the air, that sort of thing. But kind of here's an example of you know, our typical stuff that we do. And of course we have no audio. Well, even without audio, I guess we can get an idea of the footage and that sort of thing. And I'll preface this by saying I'm not a death by PowerPoint person, so I have a short PowerPoint and then if y'all have any questions for me, I can't go into those deep technical details the last guy did, but I'll try. These were all actors, they were all uh, signed waivers before we flew over. But it kind of gives you an idea. So like I said, there's kind of two routes into what I do as far as like running a UAV based business. Um, there's probably other routes, but the main two that I've encountered are people like me that got into it from a camera standpoint. You know, we do photography, we do videography, but we're just trying to find a way to get the camera somewhere new. And then there's the people that you know, been uh, building and tinkering with small UAVs, the racing UAVs, all that sort of thing, and then they just realized that they kind of developed a skill set doing that that can lead them to a new profession. Um, and I've encountered some people like that that were just ridiculously talented and good at what they do, so those guys are probably going to be very successful because if I break something, i got to send it off for repair. If they break something, they whip out the tools and fix it themselves. I'm assuming probably a lot of people in this room are probably in that ladder group, maybe that could build build the things, that sort of thing. That may be wrong. Um, and I'm sure, I believe Kyle probably touched on a lot of this this morning, as far as what you got to do to do what we do legally. That is kind of constantly evolving. Um, there's rumors that the fed, uh, federal side is going to issue some new rules this later this year. That's kind of always a rumor. So. We just kind of go with what the current laws are until something changes. Um, but this is kind of the basics. Um, I put on there FAA 333 exemption. That's kind of the one thing that's non-negotiable, I think. Um, if you're going to do it in North Carolina, you need to have North Carolina um, UAV operators, like commercial permit, pass a little knowledge test and all that. Um, business license, that's to keep you legal operating any kind of business. That's not really specific to a UAV. That's if you're going to do anything in the business. Um, North Carolina general statutes. So North Carolina is one of the few states that actually has written laws on the books about drones, about what you can and can't do with them and where you can and cannot do those things. Um, like taking off from state property. Um, if we were to try to fly a drone out of the parking lot here without NC State's permission, we would be in violation of, I believe it's 300.2 for flying from, launching or recovering from state property without permission. Um, so things like that. North Carolina was kind of ahead of the curve on that. They put laws into place before a lot of other states did, so that was kind of a good thing. I feel like I'm kissing.
Um, and then liability insurance, I put that on there. It's not a requirement, but it's a really good idea. If you're going to be flying a drone that could potentially hurt or kill someone or damage a lot of property, um, and you don't have liability insurance, you're not making good decisions already. Um, we've had very expensive drones fall out of the sky through no fault of our own. You know, we put $10,000 in a river um, in Augusta, Georgia. We did nothing wrong, and it's at the bottom of the river. Uh, I'm thankful it's at the bottom of the river and not on top of someone's head. So that's why I say that. Um, most frequent challenges, those are kind of fairly rapidly evolving. Um, one of the big ones is not something we thought about going into, into this, the non-existent pricing structure. Nobody really knew what to charge for what we do. Um, I kind of based my pricing off the regular photography and film industry and had to modify it a little bit based on our market here in Raleigh and then we do a lot of traveling, but that was one of those problems I didn't really foresee, um, was not really knowing what to charge. Um, now that I have a pretty set pricing structure, I have people call me all the time from other UAV businesses wanting to know what I charge. And I try to explain to them, I'm not trying to be rude, but I had to figure it out, so you, know, you do too. Um, hobbyists misrepresenting themselves as professionals causes us trouble all the time. Um, you have people that are going out trying to sell their services, doing what we do, but they haven't jumped through all the hoops we did to do this legally. And because of that, they misrepresent what the rules are, they misrepresent what they can and can't do, where they can and can't do it. They give all this bad information to potential clients and then we have to kind of try to unravel that and point clients in the right direction. And really it ends up with people that regularly hire UAVs being just completely confused about what, what's right and what's wrong. Um, probably our biggest industry is real estate, commercial, residential, we do a lot of real estate. Realtors are completely just beyond confused right now because they've got guys like me that are trying to follow the rules, telling them here's what the law requires, here's the website of the federal government where you can go see what the law requires, and then they've got other unnamed people that tell them, no, we can do this, we don't have to have anything, um, you don't have to worry about it because you're not the one flying the drone, and it just creates a nightmare for us trying to manage that. And then, of course, their prices are going to be cheaper because they've not jumped through all the hoops and are not using professional equipment. Um, unrealistic expectation of clients, that's just, that is what it is. That's probably in every business. They think you can do everything with nothing. Clients think we can fly drones through trees to get a video shot for them. Uh, they think we can, they, that we'll fly a drone inside their house. It, you name it, they want us to do it, and we have to kind of deal with that. Um, Confusing state of regulations. I'm sure other people in this room would agree that it is getting better, but it's still a little money, you know, for some people. But it has gotten a lot better in the last 12 months. Probably things have gotten a lot more uh, solidified. So now we kind of know what we got to do, what we what we can't do, and that sort of thing. Evolving to keep up with new techniques and capabilities. Uh, it's kind of limitless what you can do with a drone. I'm sure somebody either sitting in this room or going to school here is going to develop some new technique of some sort that you can do with a drone. Just the, the surveying and 3D mapping and all that that we've gotten into in the last couple of years has blown me away. The fact that I can go out over a construction site and get a extremely accurate 3D topographic map of that site using nothing but photos just amazes me. And if you're going to work with UAVs, you're at the mercy of the weather. Um, if you're a busy UAV operator or a busy photographer, videographer, the weather is your worst nightmare. Uh, this last week of rain has created a scheduling nightmare for me. Um, you know, we're always running around trying to play catch up and uh, deal with that. But until you, one of you guys develops a waterproof drone that can fly in the rain, I'm kind of at the mercy of it. Kind of stuck there. Um, did anybody see this, this photo? Um, did anybody actually see this on TV when it happened? Um, this was in, was it Switzerland? I believe this was in Switzerland. It was a commercial UAV operator who I actually 
spoke to online. I didn't talk to him in person, but we talked to him online about what happened. And he was flying about a $15,000 setup with about another $30,000 worth of camera on board. And he almost took out, I think, one of the world's top downhill skiers. Yeah, had a drone almost land on the guy's head. So you're talking on the light side, probably 28, 30 pounds of drone and camera. And all of this was through things that happened. So third one down, clients will try to talk you into breaking the rules. He broke one of his own rules. Um, he, he told them when they booked him to, hire, to do this job that he needed a staging area where he could keep his equipment, keep his batteries, keep everything warm. Um, things happened, the VIPs showed up, his staging room became a VIP waiting area so VIPs didn't get cold at the ski slopes and now his waiting area became uh, outside. So basically the lithium polymer batteries froze and he didn't realize this and they were misreporting their voltage so once his drone is up doing its thing um, and it drained the voltage or drained the available voltage out of the non-frozen parts of the battery when it got to the frozen part it had nothing left to give and his drone fell out of the sky thankfully it didn't kill the steer made for some crazy tv and a lot of news coverage but you know he kind of broke his own rule and that he you know let them dictate what he did and he paid for it with his equipment according to him though he's fully insured for uh, equipment replacement, so that was a good thing. Uh, things to consider for prospective business owners. I just had to throw a swag photo up there because I couldn't think of anything else to put for that slide. Uh, equipment is not cheap. Uh, not cheap at all. We spend a fortune on equipment. Um, my, I've tried to run my business with a zero debt business model, and to this point I've succeeded. But just in this photo alone, you're looking at close to $150,000 worth of equipment. Um, so it, it, is, it is not cheap, it is constantly evolving. It's just like computers. You know, as soon as you get a, you know, the latest, greatest MacBook, three months from now they come out with a new one and yours is now obsolete. Cameras are no different, drones are no different. Uh, the standards that you know, people that hire us to do TV and movie and all that stuff, their, their standards are really high and they expect you to have this equipment. So, that's a big consideration, either whether it's outside funding, self-funded, whatever, just know that the stuff, stuff is not cheap and you can't just have one. You can't show up at a film shoot or a photo shoot with one UAV and one camera and expect to be, really can't expect to be hired. Most of the times I'm required to send a list of what I'm going to bring to a shoot. They expect multiple UAVs, multiple camera systems, backups for everything, a backup for your backup for good reason. You know, their time is money and they expect you to respect that. Um, advertising traditionally is one of the big expenses, but it doesn't have to be. So for me, how I've, a big way that I've grown our business was uh, using social media. I've used uh, partnerships with a lot of local entities. Um, Triangle Downtown Magazine, uh, the Raleigh Chamber of Commerce, Visit Raleigh, um, the Downtown Raleigh Alliance. There's a bunch of like local Raleigh and Durham based entities that I've partnered with. So I provide them with fresh images, fresh video, all these clips for their website and social media, and in return they provide me with free advertising. So building those partnerships with local people, local businesses has really helped a lot. And like for me, you know, I can do one little 30 second video maybe of Raleigh or some type of event and throw it out to these people and instead of you know, my three or 4,000 Facebook or 10,000 whatever Twitter followers seeing it, they might have 100,000 or half million. So it gets it out in front of a lot of people. So that thing we found to be very, very valuable is building those relationships and taking advantage of social media. Um, I've, I've learned that if you're going to spend the money, you know, make sure you do it on your website. Um, you know, some of these free website things. I'm probably talking to the wrong crowd on that. You guys are probably good on building websites. But I found that that was where I needed to spend money. And like I said, I wasn't going to kill you with PowerPoints. I left it open for questions. If anybody has any, um, I will happily answer them to the best of my ability. Anything? Yes, sir? Uh, you probably see the one rock, one pill video of a guy going to rock and uh, UAV on the... Taking it out. I heard about it. I don't know if I've seen it. I did see a golf ball where they did a one shot with a golf ball and took one out. Uh, are you protected in any way monetarily if somebody takes your Well, 
because my, from my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, from my understanding from the flight standards, FAA flight standards office in Greensboro, is because my aircraft are registered with the FAA as aircraft, and I am a um, FAA licensed UAV operator, that that is considered an aircraft by legal definition and intentionally taking that down, you know, bringing one down, can carry the same penalty as bringing down a Cessna or a helicopter. That, that's, that's my understanding. Now, I don't know that they've successfully or even attempted to prosecute anyone for that, because I know they've had a few incidents where people have shot them down with 12 gauges. And, yeah, I've talked to a lot of people that have that in the back of their minds. Oh, we hear it all the time, yeah. um, you know, when we go, like, especially shooting real estate. You know, someone would fly it over my house and we'll shoot it down. Like, a, one, I'm not going to fly it over your house because there's certain rules on how far I can be from the house, which is why I use a big camera with a long zoom lens. And two, I'm like, it's, it's not smart. Look it up. But monetarily, I have insurance on the drones. I haven't even looked at the policy to see if it covers, you know, someone intentionally taking one down. But I can tell you, I'll, I will sue their ass in court <laughs> to try. You know, at the very least. No, you're, you're exactly right. You know, shooting an aircraft, these are aircraft, so right. shooting an aircraft is only offense. A lot of people that talk about, you know, flying through my neighborhood. All right, so shooting a gun in a neighborhood, not exactly a good idea either besides city limits. So. Especially in Raleigh. Bingo. Raleigh City Code 12 dash, I forget which one it is. I also have a background in law enforcement. I don't normally share that, but I do have a background in law enforcement, so I can kind of take care of some things in, in that aspect, or at least know what's going on, which is probably what's helped me navigate this muddy legal landscape, right? But yeah, um, I have, thankfully it hasn't happened to me yet. I have had it threatened, and I find to just, if I can just land and go on, move on, you know, come back when they're not home, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's just done. I saw a hand, yes sir? Yeah, I, um, I have a question about the cameras, but just before that, since you mentioned the guns, uh, Somebody did make and they do sell the gun, which basically shoots uh, a jamming signal, right? A fairly wide band. So the question about possible protection laws are still very relevant. Yeah, and so it's it doesn't have to be an illegal way of bringing it down, just a non-legislative way. Right. Okay. And um, there is a company that was developing. I forget what they call it, but it's like a drone shield sort of thing to bring down a UAV. And they were trying to market that to government. Uh, they're trying to market that like to the FAA, to um, I believe specifically to Homeland Security to use around like major events where they can you know bring down a UAV that's flying over the Super Bowl or that sort of thing. Um, I think as far right now as the FAA is concerned, or at least the way I understand it, is no matter the means, if you intentionally bring one down, that you know falls under basically downing an aircraft. So. Uh to ask my actual question. Yes, yes. <laughs> so um, a lot of people, uh, well, at least several distinct groups that have seen flying cameras on drones. Right. More more as an amateur and a hobbyist and not in the old class, uh, have seen problems with uh, vibrations, either the airframe or rotors, for rotary ones, right. causing a sort of compression wave going through the CCD or anything. Yeah, it's what they call jello, basically. So, yeah. yeah, and there's actually been work at how do you avoid that. So I'm going to ask a you know, person who lives on, you know, makes a living right. on that basis, is it like you buy the how do we right avoid camera? It? Sure. Um, a lot of it depends on your gimbal setup. Um, a lot of the smaller, you're probably seeing a lot of that on the like little DJI Phantoms. They're, they're really small, they're really lightweight, and they have a small camera. So, so the gimbal issue, I, I, I'm willing to move past that because that will generate shake and we know you can remove that if you're willing to overshoot a bit, but the compression, that is actual distortion, the general right. effect as you mentioned, uh, that that will come from inside the image capture device typically, like the CCD getting on. Right, it's almost like rolling shutter because it's moving around while it's... Right, so the image actually kind of compresses, decompresses and so on. Right. That's that's much harder to get out. So oh yeah, it's very difficult to get out. It's almost it pretty much ruins those shots. So how do you? Is it that if you buy the right camera and spend the right money, you won't have to worry about that? That helps. Plus knowing um, knowing the temperature rating on your rubber dampers because we have a selection of dampers that we use to mount the camera. So the 
the cameras are mounted to the gimbal, usually three axis, and then the gimbal is mounted to the body of the aircraft via rubber dampers. And then we use, the rubber dampers have like a, kind of like a hole through the middle of them, so I'll use like industrial type zip ties through the hole, but, but affixed loosely to where they don't affect the motion, but to where if for some reason the damper were to pop out, the zip tie still keeps the camera from falling free of the aircraft. So, but um, the, the warmer it is, the stiffer the rubber damper I use. I, I believe we have four different levels of them, and they're color coded. So you have like black ones, you have gray ones, you have white ones, and I think we have like some really bright silver ones. And so in hotter, warmer weather, you want to use a stiffer uh, rubber. In cold weather, you want to use the softest because just, just the temperature alone will stiffen that one up. So a lot of that is knowing, okay, I'm going to be shooting in, you know, Raleigh in July. I need to go with the, the stiffest damper as I can. And that cuts most of that out. Every now and then it will creep in, and there's really not a lot. If it happens on the fly, there's really nothing we can do about it, and it's almost impossible to remove from the footage because it literally, like you said, it looks almost like waves rippling through the video. But that's the way we found to minimize it. Um, the bigger, heavier cameras and heavier gimbals seem to weather that a little better, I think just by sure virtue of their weight. Now, Matt, can you uh, do quite a bit of work to balance all of your propellers? Oddly enough, um, we use almost exclusively uh, DJI-based products, so whether it be the big Octos, the Hexas, and all that, but they all, all those propellers come from them pre-balanced. Um, I, I don't remember, I haven't had to balance a propeller in probably three years, four years. You talk about like the old spin balancers, I haven't had to do that in a long time. Uh, but yeah, used to, we would have to you'd have to spin them and then do the sandpaper or put the tape on one section and all that. We really don't have that issue anymore. And DJI is pretty good about it. If they send you an out of balance propeller, you just trash it and they'll send you another set. But we, thankfully, we're not running into that too much anymore. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a nightmare a few years ago. But the, the technology is evolving at such a rapid pace, it's really hard to keep up with. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's odd. Um, her, her question was about insurance and about our experience with insurance. Um, we have found that for what we do, we have to go through an aviation insurer. Um, there's one company that I've dealt with. There's actually two companies I've dealt with. One is called Transport Risk, and the other is called um, Aerial Pack. PAK, and their uh, aerial pack is a subsidy of Hill and Usher. And Hill and Usher specializes in photography. And aerial pack is their aviation. They basically, they were kind of thinking ahead of the game, and they saw that UAV photography was going to be uh, a big thing. So they partnered up with some of their underwriters to de develop a specific set of policies for aerial photographers. So they just kind of merged those two together. That's who I currently use now. I did go with transport risk, but their um, their premiums were based on number of aircraft, um, number of operators in the business, and by the time, like our policy with them was over ten thousand dollars a year, which is ridiculous for for insuring. You know, the average drone we I think the, the main ones we use now are the uh, like the smaller DJI and Spire Pros. They're like eight thousand dollars, so I don't need to be paying ten thousand dollars a year. For a couple eight thousand dollar aircraft, um, we did we, we used the big hex and octaves, but we don't really see the advantage of them anymore. They're so big, they're so cumbersome. The batteries for them are over a thousand dollars a piece. They're just it's ridiculous. But that's been my experience with them. It will. Right. Yeah, I have a five million dollar general liability, um, so I'm good covered for $5 million in general liability, then the property replacement is based on the, you have to set the value. Yeah, I set the value of each aircraft, assign each one of those a unique identifier with the insurance company, and then they factor that into my premium. Um, but it's it's very specific. If, uh, if it's, you know, this aircraft carrying this camera goes down, they'll literally write you a check for this exact amount. Um, thankfully, though, this one, they do not require that you um, send them in the aircraft. 
So if you were to have like a catastrophic loss over water, where you just can't recover it, they'll still cover it. Whereas transport risk, you have to send them the downed aircraft. So even if you have equipment replacement, if you can't recover it from the river, ocean, whatever, you don't get it replaced. It's a level of where you got to have to survive a um, You have to have at least six rotors to survive a motor out. Yeah, four, any, any multi, any quad cannot survive cannot survive losing a, uh, a propeller. It, it requires all four to fly. If you have six, six or more and they will. Um, uh, our, our hexes can survive losing one and they can still, they'll rotate around that one propeller but uh, you can fly them home. You can actually put them in, uh, it's called the intelligent orientation mode and then just pull back on the stick and they'll come back to you even though they're rotating. Um, and the eight rotors can lose two, but they can't be two beside one another. So, I think they're going to count. I've reached my limit. Did anybody have any pressing questions though before I go? Anything I didn't cover? Anything I should have covered? Well, thank you guys. I hope I didn't bore you to death. Thanks.